afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to in-person class. Um, it's been a minute since um, we have been all together uh, in class here. So maybe let's see whether there are any questions about the lectures I recorded or anything, any of the announcements I shared. Is anything unclear in terms of the logistics or the content of the, of the course so far? Okay, um, all right, I shared an announcement just a few minutes ago about the mid-course feedback. Um, I would really appreciate if you do submit your feedback, it really helps me understand what kind of, what kind of things are going well, what kind of things would be good to change. Um, so it's a, it's a great opportunity from, to hear back from you uh, without you, know, you being more maybe relaxed to share your feedback uh, because it's anonymous. Um, this mid-course mid feedback is not going to affect my evaluation, but the final course feedback is also considered when I'm evaluated whether I get to keep this job or not. So when we come to the final uh, course feedback, I will take 15 minutes of the class for you to submit that. Um, yeah, and if 80% um, of you uh, or more submit the feedback, either midterm or final, I, get, uh, I give you point. No, 0.2% to your final grade to encourage you to see it. Okay, any questions about feedback? All right, so yeah, then um, we can move on with our, with our content, with the contents of the class. So um, we are still answering the same question, why the model made certain prediction. And uh, so far we had multiple ways of approaching that problem. We had uh, generated an explanation or additional information in plain English with uh, so-called free text explanation or chain of thoughts. Uh, we then uh, moved to another way of approaching this and we were looking into what kind of, uh, what parts of the input, what words or pixels are responsible for the predictions. And we focused on the uh, gradient-based uh, highlighting here. And then in the lectures, I also showed you a select and predict approach, uh, which basically produces a binary mask over the tokens and then based on only selected tokens makes the prediction. And then we moved into higher level features. We were talking about, I mean, I was talking about it in the, in the recording uh, about the, uh, possibility that a uh, relationship between different parts of the input, between word-to-word -word relationship or patch of image to patch of image relationship is responsible for the prediction. And there I showed you how you can go about this using attention-based explanation. I also mentioned that there is a whole debate about whether such explanations are faithful or not. Uh, and I showed you one tweak of the attention matrix you can do to uh, make it more closer to what was actually used for the prediction. We have made a projection to the null space of the value matrix, and then we use the co component orthogonal to that one, and that was uh, effective attention. So yeah, if you're going to use attention matrices, have in mind that there are there is more than just using the matrix in the self-attention layer and visualizing it. You need to do this extra tweaks, be it do the effective attention, or I also mentioned that you can be examining the norm of the value metrics together with the actual numbers in the attention metrics. Um, so yeah, if you are reviewing your paper and they just say, I, we use attention matrices without any extra tweaks, you can be suspicious and say, why didn't you use these better approaches? And then this uh, Monday, we have uh, talked about concept-based explanations and for that, we have uh, discussed in length the TCAP scores. I really appreciate how everyone act, uh, was active during the discussion. Um, yeah, this is one of my favorite papers in this course. I, re enjoy, I enjoy rereading it every time uh, I need to. Uh, and now with all of that, we are moving to uh, yet another way of approaching the question why the model made um, certain prediction. So, so far we have been looking at free text explanations or input highlights. So we were looking into the mechanisms of input and output of the model, trying to find something in the input or trying to find something in the output to say what was uh, what is going on with, the, uh, with our model. 
However, the another part of the model that is um, responsible for its overall behavior is the training process. So what is going, what is what did the model say during the training? It is going to influence what the model does does when uh, it's time to make a prediction. So, so we are going to try to find what kind of data points had influenced the uh, the model's prediction. To kind of motivate this, imagine you have a neural network and it's uh, predicting what is uh, what kind of label, uh, how it should label a given image. And here it labels this is a picture of a dog, which is correct. Uh, with this new approach we are now introducing, given our training data, which is here a very small training a set of a fish, a dog, and another dog, uh, we would say, well, this is the uh, this is the most we we would expect that this one is the most important example for predicting that this test set image is a dog because it's a dog of a white color, unlike a brown dog here. Okay, so specifically, we are going to approach this question of which training examples were responsible for this prediction by answering which examples, if removed, would change the loss a lot. So I, I, I think you might be noticing the pattern here with all of our local explainability methods. We always have something we deem could be important for the prediction, be it an input uh, representation, uh, some representation of some concept, or now here, uh, some training example. And then we make uh, what we would say intervention, we remove it and we check what would happen with our loss. If there is a big change, that's, um, that's a reason to say that that example was uh, important. So with our little example, this would mean that we would remove uh, the important image that we have automatically identified to be important. And we would retrain our neural network. And now for the same uh, picture, we can we have two, two neural networks, one which was trained on the full data and predicted with 82% confidence that this is a dog, and another neural network, which was trained on all the data except one training point, one training point that makes a prediction also this is a dog, but with way smaller confidence. And now we can say, okay, this example was kind of important because the confidence of the model was affected by removing that data point. So in the, the high level thing we want to compute with uh, data influence is how the loss would change if we, uh, instead of our original parameters, train parameters, we get parameters that we obtained by training our neural network without that single training example. And obviously, I think I asked this multiple times, but so I, I won't ask you again. The issue here is that this procedure, leave one out, retraining, requires that we retrain a neural network as many times as there are training examples in our training data set. So if we had 1,000 examples for every single uh, one of them, we would train a neural network, which is as we, I hope, all know now, something we really don't want to do. You would need to run 1,000 CHPC jobs and manage to get them in the queue. So we will never actually compute this. We are going to approximate this. And that's the idea behind computing data influence. Finding a method that approximates this to the best possible, uh, in a best possible way, um, that is also efficient in terms of you know training examples, number of parameters, uh, and so and so on. Okay, are there any questions about the what are we trying to do here? Yeah. yeah. Um, I just wanted to talk about that itself. This just sounds good really computational expenses. Yeah. Does that mean that all in the end? So leave one, one, leave one out retraining is not feasible. Uh, and this is not what we are actually going to do. We are trying to find a method that can approximate the difference between these two losses without us retraining a model ever. So that's the that's what's coming next. Still, even the approximations can be slow.
Okay, so um, so we are trying to approximate the difference uh, in the loss if we had uh, retrained a neural network without a single example. And we have now said, okay, repeatedly retraining is uh, slow and we do not want to do that. So uh, we are going to find approximations and uh, a paper from 2017 had um, actually observed that, great, we can use um, a, a classical technique in statistics uh, that computes uh, something like this. So this is one of the nice examples where you learn about some technique in some course and you're like, oh, I will never use it. And then you end up using it for something quite uh, modern. So there's a little life lesson here uh, as well. Um, okay, so this classical result from the statistics tells us how to calculate influence of upweighting a data point on the parameters. So it tells us how the parameters will change if we are um, if we upweight one uh, data point. And you might now be confused because I'm talking about upweighting and we want to remove a point. Upweighting and kind of downweighting are for this technique more of um, kind of the same because you can always downweight by using a weight of your upweighting to be minus something. So it doesn't really matter, but the original uh, method from statistics talks about upweighting. Okay, so this is the most math we will see in this course. It gets pretty intense at some point. So I will start uh, the initial stuff with writing on my iPad. And then later on, I will stop writing and uh, it might be a little bit hard to understand all the math. So if you feel overwhelmed at some point, that's to be expected. This, this line of literature is harder to read. It's not one of your prototypical LNM papers like the first, first one we have read when we were discussing the faithfulness of free text explanations. Okay, so um, let me introduce some notation uh, first. I will also look at my notes a little bit because I will surely get lost as well. So we are going to have, <clears throat> excuse me, also I'm not showing. You need to shout at me when I'm not showing my iPad. There we go. Okay, so we are going to have a data set of our point, data points. And um, also I want to mention that there are different notations in different influence, data influence papers. And I'm not going to use the notation introduced in the uh, original 2017 paper. Uh, I will use notation from the paper we are going to discuss uh, next time to help us kind of have similar language when we move to that next paper. Uh, that paper that we are going to read also has a nice background section where they go over the 2017 uh, method. So going back to the notation, we are going to have a, uh, a data set of our data points. And we are going to use notation ZI because our data points can uh, be just generations. So we don't have actual labels or they can be classification data sets. So they could have both XI input and YI out. So this just simplifies how we write these things to kind of consider both generative and classification uh, setup. And then when we do optimization, we are finding parameters theta star that are going to minimize our cost function, J of uh, theta, given our training data set D. Can you see this? Great. Okay, and we work in a d-dimensional space. So all of the parameters of the model are, there are d of them. And our cost function is going to just be the standard thing, the average of the loss. So we'll have sum over losses of all of our zi's so given theta ei goes from uh, i goes from 1 to n and we are going to average them okay now with data influence uh, specifically with influence functions from 2017 we are going to make some assumptions 
And everything we are going to talk about later on is how these assumptions are not great. But these are some assumptions that were uh, initially made. So, oops. First one is that Theta star exists, is unique, and is uh, computable. Anyone has immediate reaction at this? Yeah, please. Exactly. So neural networks have a many, many optima, and assuming there is one of them is simply uh, incorrect. Uh, so yeah, sure, it will probably exist, uh, but it's not going to be unique. Um, and also, we probably will end up in some local, very good local optimum, but it won't really minimize this function. So the gradient of this function with these parameters won't be exactly zero as well. All right. And now we are going to introduce something else. We are going to introduce theta star as a function of some uh, epsilon. And this epsilon corresponds to up-weighting a uh, data point. So this is going to be parameters we get basically when we remove a data point. So I apologize for saying up-weighting and removing. Think about them as the same things, things that are achievable with epsilons. If epsilon is positive, you are up-weighting. If epsilon is negative, you are down-weighting. Um, so up-weighting or down-weighting, it's all captured with epsilon. Any questions? Why do we call it up-weighting? It's because in the in the original influence function paper from the seventies, it was the paper was written for upweighting the data point, not for downweighting. But here we have this uh, goal of removing it. So there is a mismatch between the original method and what we are trying to achieve. So all of these um, derivations and introductions of influence functions for finding influential training examples start with the original form. And only later on, you introduce epsilon to be equal minus one over n, where n is the number of data points. Okay, so as I said, uh, the theta uh, star epsilon will be the, um, correspond to the uh, parameters we get when we minimize uh, the cost function, but not in um, on the same same data set D we had before. Here we have a data set where we had uh, upweighted one training examples by epsilon. So this can be written down as a minimizer of our uh, loss function or cost function we had before. So this is what we are seeing, what we have seen before, but now we are going to add uh, a little bit more weight to the loss of example ZM. And this corresponds to upweighting this example a little bit more. All right. So, so far, pretty easy. Um, now, um, I will let you know what we are trying to compute. So, that result from the statistics uh, gives us following formula. So, that comes from that paper from a few decades ago. It tells us that the influence on the parameters theta star from upweighting a data point Zm is by definition, their definition, the derivative of this function of the parameters theta star with respect to epsilon. And derivative is taken with respect to epsilon and we then take epsilon equals zero. So that, met, that paper tells us this is what you need to compute. We take that result for granted. And now there is a question of how to how to compute uh, this one, and this is going what we are going to derive now. Okay, so we are deriving what 
what this is. We want to find formula for this derivative. We are going to start with knowing, we observe, repeat, whatever, that um, our epsilon star, uh, excuse me, theta star epsilon uh, is uh, minimizes, um, it minimizes this one. I'm gonna write it here as a, as a star. So if a certain variable, input variable minimizes a function, uh, what is the value of the derivative of that function in that data point? What, it, what is going to be equal to zero? zero. So we do know, oh, I'll be like this, that zero equals to gradient of j in theta star epsilon on our original data points plus epsilon of the gradient of the loss function of z m theta star epsilon. So we have taken this function here. We just added the derivative symbol, so we didn't derive anything actually. Uh, and we know this is going to be equal to zero. Okay. So now we are going to um, think about what happens when epsilon um, goes to zero. Well, then uh, the this part is going to go to zero, right? And all we are left with is this part, which is exactly the same as this part. So as epsilon goes to zero, our parameters theta epsilon will go to what? If no up weighting had happened, and we know that certain parameters are minimizing the original data points, then what are we getting here? Say it out loud. Theta yeah. star. Yeah, exactly. So we know this is going to happen. So what we are going to do here with this part over here is we, we is that we are going to do the first order Taylor approximation of this function. Function being this whole thing is our function. We are using this property that when epsilon goes to zero, this data this theta star uh, theta star epsilon will go to uh, theta star. So we can do the uh, the the uh, Taylor approximation around that point. So here. I will write it like this. All right, so we can write gradient of J, but now here we have theta star, not theta star epsilon on the original data points plus epsilon times delta L Z M again, we are not dragging epsilon anymore. And because we are doing the Taylor expansion here, first order one, we are taking the first uh, derivative of this whole function here given by these two terms. Um, and we will of course have the difference between theta, uh, theta uh, star epsilon minus theta star times and now the uh, derivative of our derivative, which gives us the uh, second uh, derivative of uh, all the terms in our function. We are doing the Taylor expansion of. Oh, barely made it, oh no.
Okay, so just to recap, um, because we know this is going to happen, we can use the first order Taylor uh, approximation of this function given by these two terms here uh, around uh, a, a data point. And yeah. Okay, is that clear? If you don't remember how exactly Taylor expansion looks like, um, maybe this is slightly confusing, but there is not much happening here. We have just replaced the theta star epsilon with theta star, and we added this term here, which is basically um, kind of the, uh, the first uh, derivative of this function, which is derivative uh, itself. So maybe a slightly confusing. Okay, so now, from here, we have this term over here, which is pretty sweet because we are interested in how much parameters are going to change when we upweight the point by epsilon. So this is what we are interested in. And we are going to take that on one side. Um, I'm going to I'm going to change the color. I feel like it might be helpful for some reason. <laughs> Uh, so here we have theta star epsilon minus theta star. And we're just rearranging this equation. We have zero equals two. And then all of this, we are going to put this on one side and or actually have this term over here on the other side and then divide by what this uh, difference is, um, you know, a multiplied width. So that gives us uh, minus gradient of the cost in our parameters, theta star t plus epsilon times delta, uh, not delta, excuse me, the derivative of the loss in Zm with parameters theta star, and then times what's uh, this part over here, but inverse of it. So we'll have the second derivative of the cost function in the same parameters, same data plus epsilon times second derivative of the loss in the ZM uh, in the same parameters that theta uh, star, all to the minus one because we are dividing this. Okay. Are there, are you lost? Are you following? Pretty good? Okay, great. So let's now do our favorite thing in math and that's uh, remove certain things. Um, let me see which ones exactly. Okay, so. All right, maybe I'll ask you. Uh, which term here equals to zero? And to make it simpler, this will be term one, term two, term three, term four. Sorry, second? No. Only one of them. There are four, and only one of them is zero. So, one, zero. It's going, but it's not really zero. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So as we said before, if something minimizes a function and theta star minimizes function j, then the gradient of that function in that minimizing point will be equal to zero. So here we know that this equals zero. If this is zero, the derivative is zero, is then the second derivative is zero? It's not. So an example would be, uh, a square function. The first derivative is 2x in zero is going to be zero. 
And then the second derivative is two, and that's a constant function that in zero will be positive. So just because this is negative, this is zero, that will be negative. Uh, which uh, initially I was like, ah, canceling out this one. And I was like, no, 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 that's, that's not true. Um, in, the, in the influence function paper 2017 one, they also say they are going to remove this term. This term comes from our uh, first order Taylor approximation. So it's this kind of like a trailing term that makes the approximation worse, but it's still a solid approximation without it. So we can remove this one because that, that's the what I know, extra term in our approximation, which is which is small, way smaller relative to, to this part. So I will write here from because all right. So Let's write what we are left with. Our theta star epsilon minus theta star equals to minus epsilon gradient of the loss in our upweighted point ZM given our original data points times second derivative of the cost function theta in the uh, with the uh, parameters theta star in the original data uh, in with inverted. Okay, so this is a point where we probably have forgotten what are we even trying to uh, do. And what we are trying to do is calculate this, right? We want to find a formula for our derivative of the theta star function that depends on the epsilon with respect to the epsilon in when epsilon equals uh, zero. All right, so. Um, if we look at what we have right now, we have theta star epsilon here, we have theta star epsilon here. What would happen if we just do make a derivative of, of this one? Actually, we could do that to get what we want because what will happen with the um, with theta star when we take the derivative of it with respect to the epsilon? It's going to be zero because it doesn't depend uh, on the on epsilon, right? Okay, what will happen with this function over here? Let's think about in terms of what depends on epsilon and what doesn't. We have epsilon, epsilon obviously de depends on epsilon. Derivative of epsilon with respect to epsilon is how much? One. And then everything that's left, we do we see anything that depends on epsilon? We do not. So this is as, as if we have a C where C is a constant times epsilon uh, line. So what we end up with, we take the derivative with respect to epsilon, then we'll have derivative of the set theta star epsilon with respect to epsilon minus uh, derivative of theta star with respect to epsilon. And we said this is going to be zero. And then here I will, uh, I don't know how to, here we have epsilon. That's a thing that depends on the epsilon. Everything else doesn't. So what we are left is with the with that constant, which is the derivative of Zm theta star. Um, and now here I will replace uh, the, the second derivative of the cos function with the more appropriate notation, which is Hessian of the cos function. It's the same, uh, it's the same uh, thing, just a different way of writing it. So Hessian with respect to the parameters theta star, to invert it. Um, yeah, and just in case you forgot how Hessians look like, so here they will have this one, Hessian of theta star. 
with respect to our cos function j, we'll have following notation. We will have a second derivative of j with respect to the first parameter theta one, second derivative. Here we'll have second derivative with respect to theta d because we have d parameters and then uh, derivative uh, with, uh, with respect to theta one. And here we'll have second derivative with respect to theta one, then theta d. And here, okay. So this is just a little reminder. Any immediate reactions to this? We do need to compute this. Immediate reaction is, I would probably scream because, come on, what is the size of the models we have been using in our assignments? And those are small square, ones. Square yeah, so lama two, the smallest we use has 7 billion parameters. So now we have a square of that. And we need to invert this matrix, right? So pretty scary. But in 2017, this was feasible. We didn't have models that were this, this large. So uh, I kind of digressed with my excitement about this being awful, uh, but um, we kind of came to the end of our computations here. So here I will star, write a double star. Hopefully it will be visible later on. So we have a double star here. I will write it here again. So now we know that this equals to the minus of the gradient of the loss function in Zm original parameters times this Hessian of, of the original parameters. Oh my God, this is so ugly, <laughs> inverted. So that's basically what we were after. Rem just to remind you, we were looking at how the parameters will be changed if we had removed, upweighted a single data point, training data point. Uh, we now have a formula for that, which is given uh, here. And the influence of that in example is given with this uh, equation. It's still not exactly what we were looking for because we were talking about the influence on a specific test examples, let's say loss, if that uh, training examples uh, has been uh, removed. So we still need to uh, derive uh, that, but given everything we have here is going to be super straightforward. Um, before I do that, I do wanna mention other things we needed here. So um, for our Hessian to exist, how, what kind of property our function, our cost function J has to have? Look at the, what are we computing here? Yep. How many times? Twice. Twice, exactly. So for H exist, oops, skipping. J needs to be twice differentiable. All right, but that's not the only thing we are doing with our Hessian. We are also making an inverse of it. So um, do we remember what kind of property a matrix needs to have to be invertible? There are many of them. There are many ways of answering this question. Uh, say again. Yes, no zero determinant. That happens when um, singular, or sorry, when eigenvalues are how? In terms of positiveness, negativeness, zeroness. Mm -hmm. They also need to be positive, strictly positive. 
And when I say that positiveness, does that invoke another property of a matrix? If I say word definiteness, <laughs> positive definite. Okay, so that's all great. Um, I'm trying to bring it back to the function J here. Um, what did you say? We said that the matrix is going to be positive definite. Do you know now, knowing that Hessian has to be positive definite, how the function J has to be? What kind of, if you're taking the sec second derivative of a function to form a, pos a positive definite matrix, uh, Hessian matrix H, what kind of property our original function J must have? Convex, great. This is recap of linear algebra. Um, oh, great. So if our function for age uh, minus to the power of minus one, so for inverse to exist, um, J has to be convex. Okay, and then, which means that age is positive definite, and then um, age um, to the minus one exit. Uh, sorry, no, age is invertible, and therefore age minus one exists. Okay, now we know that our cost function has to be convex with respect to the parameters and we work with really big neural networks. So how do we feel about this? I see some head shaking, which is a good sign. It's not something we do have. Our cost functions are generally not or almost never convex with respect to the parameters. And I'm emphasizing with respect to the parameters here uh, because later on uh, we will talk about their convexivity with respect to the outputs that, and let's say cross entropy loss is convex with respect to outputs. So this, this is an important difference um, uh, with respect to what uh, we, the convexity is, uh, is discussed. So this is a, actually a pretty, pretty big uh, assumption uh, we are making together with this assumption here that uh, it is uh, unique. Okay, um, so we have learned how to quantify the change of the parameters when um, without retraining the model, but we have done this in the framework that uh, has pretty pretty strict assumptions. Um, I did say that I still need to um, uh, do one more thing, and that's uh, define the influence of uh, the of a training example ZM on our test example Z test. And we are going to talk about its influence on the loss function rather than parameters. So just to show you the slight difference in notation here. So when we put in subscript, uh, whatever we put there, we are talking about the influence on that thing. And, um, and that changes things a little bit, but basically you will always, as before, compute, try to compute the same thing. You will have derivative with respect to the epsilon when epsilon equals to zero. It's just that now, instead of taking the derivative of what we cared about before, which were theta stars, we are now taking the derivative of the other thing we now care about, which is the loss function of our test example with parameters theta star epsilon. And this is kind of a general formula. I didn't read that paper from the 70s careful enough to be 100% sure in what I will say now, but I believe that uh, you, if you are interested in the influence of function f, 
you will all you will just take the uh, when the certain point is up weighted, you will take the derivative of that function with respect to the epsilon uh, when epsilon equals to zero. And in the paper we are going to discuss next time, they bring that formulation. They instead of writing loss function, they write here function uh, f. I'm a little bit hesitant to talk about this since I didn't read that paper, so I'm not sure whether this function has to have special properties. So just have that uh, in mind if you would like to now change the loss to something completely uh, different. All right, and here we are going to use the chain rule. So we are taking the uh, derivative of the loss of uh, Z test with respect to uh, theta Oof, now I don't know which ones. Um, hmm. um, I think we are still with theta star epsilon because we are still going to um, not include epsilon equals zero uh, times derivative of the epsilon star, sorry, theta star epsilon with respect to the epsilon when epsilon equals zero. Okay, so loss function depends on the epsilon uh, on the theta star epsilon, and uh, theta star epsilon dep depends on the um, on the epsilon. So we just use the chain rule over here because the loss function here is the composition uh, that depends on the parameters theta star. So you know that's uh, composed from theta stars, and here we are just using the chain rule, and now. Um, Basically, if we were to do the full derivation, we would do kind of similar things so we have done with um, with the first order Taylor approximation that epsilon goes to zero, and uh, then those epsilon stars, um, excuse me, theta star epsilons um, are turned into our original parameters. So here we get uh, the derivative or gradient of the loss function z test in original parameters theta star transpose times and we have here the term we have uh, just derived which is the hessian with respect to the past parameters time uh, derivative of our loss function in the point zm uh, with the original parameters so with respect to theta Okay, so notice the difference here. We have Z test and here we have uh, ZM. And that gives us the influence of the um, of a training example ZM on the test example uh, Z uh, test. Um, here, um, just make a note, used a similar derivations. Okay, so um, I was I was thinking whether I want to say anything else uh, about this. So I want to go back to the slides uh, there. We just try to get out of this iPad thingy. Okay, so the slides kind of recap uh, everything I, I uh, derived. Uh, so we had, um, so now this notation is from the original paper from Ko and uh, Liang from 2017. So there is a slight change in the notation, uh, but what you are seeing here is what we derived, the uh, influence of up weighting the data point Z train, which I called ZM uh, is uh, given um, uh, on the loss function is given with uh, this equation uh, where this is the Hessian. Um, and then, here we have this uh, the thing that I just uh, showed you, which is the influence of the of the train uh, uh, training example on the test example. Here we have the loss with the Z test, and here the loss with uh, Z train. Um, and similarly to how we have seen the change in the um, in the 
here. Here we have derived the first the change of these uh, parameters was given by this equation. Again, if we would if we would do these derivations with the loss function, you would uh, get uh, this term, which is um, minus epsilon times uh, this whole term here. And now instead of taking the uh, epsilon to be put whatever epsilon, we set it to um, minus n. So yeah, I think we should be happy now to some extent because uh, we were trying to approximate this uh, equation over here. And we have find a formula that gives us that value in the as a closed form solution. So that's great. But then have in mind that along the way, we have made all those assumptions and that's going to influence how good these influence functions uh, are. Uh, we have also talked about the problem of our Hessian being a uh, uh, D-square matrix, which uh, can be enormous, especially these days when we have a number of parameters that exceed uh, you know, a dozen of billions. Um, so this is an issue. And in the original paper, they have proposed already some suggestions of how to overcome this. First thing here is to notice that this part here doesn't depend on the training points. So if you're in the end for each test example, we are trying to compute the influence with respect to every training example. Uh, but if this part doesn't uh, depend on the training example, we can compute this uh, only once. And then we can store that value. And then for every training example, we compute the is a gradient of the loss function in that training example and multiply it with that value that we stored. So we won't compute this part uh, every time. Um, so let's call this one S test. That's how we call it in Chloe and Young. And they they say, okay, this is still this uh, enormous matrix times vector computation is uh, is um, hard to compute, especially when we need to invert a huge matrix. So we are going to do something that's called uh, in numerical mathematics, implicit Hessian vector products. Uh, so we are not going to literally compute this matrix uh, age, uh, Hessian matrix and invert it. We are going to do this uh, implicitly. Um, and it's an iterative method. So you start with some value of this uh, vector and then you iteratively uh, change it. Um, and in that iterative procedure, they are going to need some kind of unbiased estimate of the matrix uh, of the Hessian. And for that, they are going to use, um, they are going to use a few uh, data points and then uh, take their um, average uh, Hessian value. Um, yeah, there are lots of details here that I don't think would be super productive to go through. So the point here to remember is that even in the original paper, even in 2017, when we worked with way smaller models, they had recognized that this is a bottleneck. And to overcome that, they have used this iterative approach uh, to compute the actual vector, the, the resulting, um, you know, uh, this vector as uh, as here uh, implicitly. Uh, but even with that, things were slow, even with their iterative uh, method. So there is this whole line of work that followed from after 2017 to speed this up, to make computation of influence functions faster. Uh, and only this year with the paper that we will read on Monday, there, this was scaled up to a realistic model sizes of today to uh, 52 billion model. Uh, which is still not the hugest model we have. It's still, it, it's still an uh, an open research problem on how to speed it up because uh, they couldn't use the entirety of their training data, for example, in the paper we are going to read on Monday, uh, because things were still still slow. Um, so yeah, kind of influence functions are uh, this very neat mathematical procedure, but very often when we have very principled approach, it comes with a lot of assumptions. And then uh, when our, you know, what we are building is going way faster, it's kind of hard to uh, catch up. But, you know, uh, that's definitely not to discourage anyone who, who wants to work on scaling these things up. 
Okay, uh, another thing uh, that we have mentioned uh, is as a strict, very strict assumption is this uh, convexivity assumption of our cost function. And to work around that, they have made a convex quadratic approximation of the loss around the uh, uh, found uh, parameters theta star that uh, are going to, that minimize the, the cost function. And uh, here they also added this damping term uh, that um, basically this damping term turns our negative eigenvalues to positive eigenvalues. And that in turn turns the matrix into a positive definite matrix, which in turn make it invertible uh, and, and so on. Um, so that's kind of how they overcome the, the convexivity issue, but it's still, uh, as we are going to now see, it's, it doesn't come with the problems. Um, any questions? I'm sure there are questions, but um, yeah, what are the questions? Okay, is the, so just a few questions then for you. Is the high level idea of what we are trying to achieve clear? Is it were the derivations to some extent, you could follow them and um, you understand that there are issues with the assumptions we are making with the computational expense. Okay, that's good. So um, yeah, as I said, these, they have certain solutions to the obvious problems, but these solutions didn't fix everything. So there are amongst the follow-ups that said, okay, we need to speed things up to actually skate to a realistic data size and to a realistic number of parameters. Um, there were also multiple observations that have shown, as with any other method we have talked about in this course, that they do not match what we should be seeing. So the quality of the influence functions uh, was uh, not great. And I think there is one amongst all of those papers, one was the most prominent. Uh, oh, there it is immediately. Yeah, so this one, which I should have referenced, um, I will make sure to edit the slide. Uh, so this paper in 2020, when it came out, it really made a really salient point that these influence functions are quite uh, fragile. So um, after, after that paper, uh, another paper had emerged which talked about all these issues in details, and that's going to be paper two for our paper discussion. Um, they, they talk about all these things in length and they said, well, listen, our influence functions are not actually solving the problem we thought they are approximating. They are not approximating the difference in the loss when we uh, remove a data point. They are actually doing something related, but not exactly that. And the thing they are doing that's related is actually um, a good characterization of what we want to achieve. We want to find influential examples uh, in, the, in the data. So they kind of change this um, overall framework of, of data influence, I would say. And then in the paper we are going to read that scale it to 52 billion parameters, they embrace this new view of what influence functions as they were proposed in Koch and Liang are actually uh, doing. It's a very dense paper though. So uh, describing all bits and pieces is going to be hard, but I do want to go through some of the points to the best of my uh, abilities. So um, here I just showed you the snippet that basically uh, repeats this uh, point that they have added this um, damping term to to overcome the convexivity. And they also uh, are citing this other paper by Tesso et al. that's uh, also important, uh, which uh, ha in these papers, they approximated Hessian with the Fisher information uh, matrix. Um, so you will see this kind of terms here instead of our uh, matrix uh, H. So, yeah, just just have in mind that sometimes you will have um, you will see instead of uh, the Hessian, 
you will see a little bit funky looking Hessian, which has these J's in front of it, which are Jacobians. Um, and it will be noted by G, this whole thing together, which is reference to Gauss, Newton, Hessian, which is basically the same as the Fisher information matrix for some losses. So already a lot, I know, but just to kind of put you uh, in the same notation uh, as some of, uh, some of the other papers. This is not hugely important. This, if you have just heard me saying a bunch of words you don't understand, then remember that instead, together with the damping term that Cole and Yang have introduced, you can uh, use the uh, uh, Fisher information matrix, which is same as the Gaussian Newton Hessian, uh, instead of in the place of the Hessian. So you will see uh, those things um, emerging in a lot of papers in 2021 and 2022. Okay, so this is basically the gist of the robustness uh, of the, yeah, the influence functions are fragile uh, problem. So here you have the, uh, on um, uh, x-axis, you have influence loss difference. That's the thing we are trying to approximate. And here is the actual retraining loss difference. So someone had actually did, did the terrible task of retraining with Lee one uh, out. And when, you, when we use a logistic regression, this looks very neat, right? This is good. This is exactly what we want to see. However, if we use uh, multi-layer perceptrons, which are way simpler than the models we have today, uh, then this uh, becomes terribly looking, right? There is no uh, correlation. I mean, there is no nice identity function that we would expect in here. Um, I mentioned that we are now going to introduce a little a new framework um, for influence function, which is uh, introduced in this paper where this figure comes from. That framework is going to be abbreviated with PBRF. And if you use that PBRF, then you see this nice uh, identity function over here. Okay, so let's try to make our way to the PBRF, our new framework. In this paper that introduces PBRF, they are uh, first starting with few with few problems that are causing uh, excuse me this situation. So this is an issue, and what we are talking about now are what is causing causing this issue. The first problem between and we will refer to these issues I have. Uh, uh, LLO misalignment, IF standing for influence functions. Um, this is a really interesting, and I wouldn't say it's uh, an obvious observation at all. They said we have taken that first order Taylor approximation of theta star epsilon around epsilon equal uh, zero. And um, what happens when we do that is that uh, our influence functions approximates the effect of removing a data point, ZM, at the local neighborhood of the optimum heta star. And maybe this illustration will help. It's a little bit hard point to follow. But what they're trying to say here is that there is the idea of cold start retraining, where you are removing a data point from the data set. You start with randomly initialized points, and then you train a network again. However, because we have assumed we are in this neighborhood of our uh, uh, point uh, theta star, which is uh, which are parameters we got with training on all of the data, we are basically um, not starting from, from scratch. We are staying in that local neighborhood of our optimal original parameters theta. So this is kind of how they, they, they describe it. Okay, if you start here, and then uh, uh, you will, this is kind of where you can uh, end up. Um, end up. But if you are now removing a data point and you are staying in the neighborhood, basically you are starting from this point here instead of some random initialization way over there. So the points where you can end up are in this L2 distance from the originally found parameters. So. It's not exactly uh, the same as starting from scratch. They also say um, neural networks exhibit uh, multiple global optima. This paper from Hesti et al say, okay, the converged parameters are dependent on the initialization. 
Uh, this is referring to what I just said when I said your solution will be uh, L2 distance apart from your original uh, from your parameter original parameters at the start if you have quadratic loss. Uh, so they're not going to be they're going to stay very close basically. So all together, influence functions do not accurately predict the effects of retraining the model from scratch. That's a first misalignment issue. They are approximating retraining the model in a closed neighborhood of the optimal parameters. So if you write this in terms of objectives, uh, objectives we have with a cold start are given here. Um, you have your original objective with all data points. You are tweaking the influence, uh, tweaking the loss of a single example. Uh, with the cold start, you are fr starting from randomly initialized weights, but here you are starting with some optimal parameters, theta uh, s. Questions? Okay, the second problem is that uh, when we add that damping term, it's uh, it has been shown in other words, that if you add a damping term like we have done, that is same as if you are doing uh, L2 regulariz regularization to the cost function. So um, uh, our, our uh, theta uh, starts uh, with, um, when we add that you know, damping term and when we uh, tweak one of the training example, we are actually having an objective that's not exactly uh, the one I have written down on my iPad, uh, it has this extra regularization term over here. Um, so what they say in the paper, influence functions aim at approximating the warm-up start retraining technique. Warm-up start being, you start with uh, not random initialization, but the one close to the optimal parameters theta start with a proximity term that penalizes the L2 distance between the new estimate and the optimal parameters that start. So you are, you influence functions have this extra, extra term that we didn't mention so far. Um, and they're calling this um, discrepancy between the warm start and proximal warm up start as the proximity gap. In terms of the objectives we are doing, now we have added another term here. So we are quite far from what we started with when I made those derivations, right? Okay, and the third one and the last one before we introduce PBRF is that um, we are assuming that our influence functions are computed on fully converged parameters. So remember, we have multiple times have used the property that the gradient of our cost function with respect to our parameters equals zero. Um, however, very often when we train models, and now you have some experience as well, we don't really train until the convergence. We are not really, we don't really hit that zero, uh, right? So we use early stopping, we use a small number of steps, all sorts of things. So very often we don't have fully converged uh, models. So what they say in this paper is then, okay, then you have a set of parameters which was trained without an example and with an example. So that one with an extra example simulates longer training. And if you are now um, measuring the differences, losses, um, this uh, difference might come from just training a slightly longer not because that example was uh, influential. So the co-founding variable is that the model benefits from that uh, extra example, which is uh, kind of makes up the longer training. After these three misalignment strings, uh, they are introducing their PBRF. Before we get into that, uh, if you assume non-convergence, uh, then they say um, you are actually, your objective is now looks like this, which is confusing because we haven't introduced this uh, term uh, D here, which we'll get to in the point. What I'm trying to kind of show here is that we have moved quite far from the objective we have started with when I started those derivations on my iPad. And that suggests that, um, things are not exactly how we represent them, right? So what in this, then in this paper they're saying is 
um, we are actually uh, optimizing for another objective when we are dealing with the, when we have our influence functions, when we have that um, formula for this is how much uh, something uh, influences um, the loss of the test example. And we should be talking about that differently. Um, so they reformulated the goal of influence functions in terms of what's called proximal Bregman response function or PBRF, which is the response function to a modified training objective called proximal Bregman objective. So here, remember, um, maybe I can bring it up again. No. Okay, so here, um, All right, so see, here we started with um, this uh, equation. We said epsilon, uh, theta star epsilon is a minimizer of this cost function. And um, and um, what else I wanted to say here? Let me just check. I'm losing my track of thoughts. All right, so yeah, I just wanted to remind you of, of what uh, ep theta star epsilon was before. Uh, but the problem is, as we have seen now, is that it's not really minimizing uh, this function over here. It is minimizing something else. So that was the first, you know, conceptual uh, error. So it's minimizing this function over here, uh, which includes all of these assumptions, cold star, warm star, proximity, and non-convergence. Um, this this uh, term over here here can be computed with this equation. If I could read the equation out loud, it's not not uh, important. I think the exact little factors. Uh, it is important what this represents, and that's approximating the effect of removing the data point while trying to keep the predictions predictions consistent with those of the partially trained model. So basically this term here, if you work your way through this equation, you will get that this term is doing this. Um, so it's removing the, uh, it's approximating the effect of removing the data point while trying to keep the prediction consistent with the dose of not any model, but the one that is partially uh, trained. Now, this is basically, instead of, you know, maybe with years, the original 2017 paper will become less relevant. And then we will start basically from here. We are going to say, Instead of me writing these uh, equations over here, I can jump in right into this because this is exactly what we are approximating with our uh, influence, uh, with our idea of the influence function. Okay, so that's been a lot based on this PBR, uh, uh, PBRF uh, framework that can then uh, uh, tweak everything what needs to be tweaked to get the influences. And then when we plot those influences, we get this nice identity function. So this is way more accurate and way less fragile than the original formulation of influence functions. So not surprisingly, in this scaling up uh, paper, they have embraced this view and build up uh, upon it. If you are interested in also improving something like this, you will probably start with uh, something like this. Okay, um, let me see. Is there anything else I wanted to say? Um, yeah, I guess I wanted to wrap up with the advantages. You know, I everyone likes influence part functions because they're very to the point. They show you exactly where the model had picked on the uh, patterns. The model learns from the data. And then if you go back to the data, you get uh, really direct information about the model. Uh, it, they are actionable, so we didn't see any evaluations, but the most common evaluation of influence functions is to poison a portion of your training data, poison the portion, portion of your test data, and then uh, with influence functions, you can find those data points in the training set that were poisoned. 
And if this was a realistic, you know, we set up then as a as a model developer, you can check that your data is not, uh, you know, noisy. If you find such uh, problematic examples with your influence functions, you can go and correct your data. For example, re-annotate it or completely remove it from your training set and uh, retrain your model to make a better, more robust uh, model. Um, it is principled to, to some extent. I mean, we have been in this uh, convex setup, uh, which makes things a little bit uh, tricky. Um, and it, this is funny. I, I took this slide from this tutorial. They say, oh, it, it kind of seemingly works empirically, at least with this data poisoning um, examples. But then we have seen that plot where things don't work really well. So the same motors of the slide cell well often require approximations that may be invalid. And so there are some, you know, with the original paper evaluations, so you will get some really good signals. But then with this uh, Basu et al. paper, it became really clear that there is something uh, not robust enough going on here. Uh, they are computationally expensive, as we have learned. Scaling them up is still an ongoing issue. If you're excited to improve this, go for it. This is very important line of work. And uh, for a while, it was not clear how does it interact with pre-trained models. All of this was done for what I've shown you with um, randomly initialized neural networks where you have your training data and your training data is still hugely important. Now we have pre-training data and we have only a few, if any, uh, fine tuning points, but this scaling up paper will go into the fraction of the pre-training data and scaling then up to the entirety of pre-training data, still an uh, ongoing challenge. All right, uh, I would like to stop here. We do have a few minutes for questions. If anyone wants to stick around and chat with me. All right, thanks. Thank you.